This is the USB Type-C power delivery board I designed. So, why'd I make it? Well, two main reasons. First, I wanted to test out USB power delivery so I could integrate it into other projects. And secondly, all the other trigger boards I've seen don't have any mounting holes, so it's much more difficult to integrate them into a project. So, if something I want doesn't exist, it's time to start designing it. Like for most of my projects, I start off by doing some research. I went to the USB Influencers Forum website and read through all 4 million pages of their USB Type-C specifications and compliance documents. I think USB Type-C has some amazing features, the best of which is undoubtedly the ability to plug it in the right way the first time, without having to flip it over three times. However, I hate how much more confusing and complicated it makes things. When you see a Type-C port, you really don't know what the port's actually capable of, unless you can find some documentation about it. Does it source or sync power? Does it support data? Does it support power delivery? If so, what voltages and at what current? Does it support quick charge, which is not the same as power delivery? Does it require electronically marked cables? And does it actually do what it says? As an example, I recently got a Nintendo Switch and the USB Type-C charger that came with it only supplies five or 15 volts, not nine and 12 as I expected it also would, which means uh, a power delivery device that requires nine volts can't be powered from it. And to go on a slight tangent, 12 volts isn't standard for power delivery, it's optional, so some power supplies and power banks might not actually include it. There have also been cases where the manufacturer's designs were incorrect and it caused issues and even damage to some user devices. Another issue is the cables themselves. You probably have no idea what the cable is actually capable of unless you test it. The fact that devices like this even exist demonstrate the problem. Then you also have the added issue of cables that are out of spec. There are also some absolute monstrosities of cables that have been created. This is the cable for my graphics tablet. USB-C on one end, and uh, yeah, what even is this? Two USB type A's and an HDMI. But in fairness, it does work, so. Then there are also adapters like these. Yes, this is a barrel jack that directly passes voltage into the USB port. So you better not plug the wrong barrel jack into it. It turns out you can just make your own USB cables too. This is my 230 volt mains to USB type C. Whoops, <laughs> must have got the live and neutral mixed up. Okay, the cables aren't quite that bad. USB Type-C should have made everything standard and compatible. In some cases it's helped, but in others it's just obfuscated and hidden the issues. Okay, enough complaining about USB Type-C, time to complain about something else, chip shortage. As I'm sure some of you know, there is currently a bit of a silicon chip shortage. So, while I was researching power delivery ICs, every time I found one I liked, it was inevitably out of stock and had ridiculous wait times, often six months to a year. As you can imagine, this was very frustrating. Eventually, I found the Ingenic IP2721 and IP2721 Max 12. They did exactly what I wanted, and more importantly, they're available for me to buy from a seller on AliExpress. I do actually really like these chips because they don't need to communicate with a microcontroller to request a specific voltage. They just request the voltage based on the state of the select pin. The data sheet specifies using a 100k resistor to pull the pin high or low. Selecting most of the other components was fairly simple. I mostly just followed the reference schematics from the data sheet and added a healthy sprinkling of capacitors. It seemed like a good idea to add some TVS diodes to help protect the circuit survive static shocks. Then I decided to add three indicator LEDs too, so I could tell what was actually going on in the circuit. I had to use fairly large 1206 resistors so they'd be able to handle the power dissipation from the 5 to 20 volt power input. I placed the first LED to show if there was power from the USB port, the second was placed after the MOSFET that's controlled by the power delivery IC, and the third was placed after the eFuse IC I used. As I mentioned, I had to order the IC separately from AliExpress, which meant JLC and PCB couldn't solder them onto the PCB for me, so I had to do them myself. First, for handling SMD parts, tweezers were required. They are far too small to hold your fingers. I found straight tweezers seemed to give me the most convenient hand positions and best control of the components. I put solder paste and flux onto the pads on the PCB, then place the components in position. My hot station was set 350 degrees, 
and used to heat the top side of the PCB with the components. Later I discovered it's actually easier to heat it from the underside as this seemed to give a more even heat distribution and allowed the components to be moved into position more easily. As you can see, as the hot air melts the solder and flux, the components start to get blown out of position and I had to use my tweezers to hold it in place. Turns out the hot air is actually pretty hot and will burn your fingers if they get too close. Also, the metal tweezers conduct heat pretty well. Here you can see some close-up shots of the solder paste melting and solidifying. I thought it looked really cool, so I'm forcing you to watch it too. I think I might have accidentally bridged two of the pins together while soldering it, so let's just zoom in to double check. Right, yeah, as you can see just here, there does appear to be some solder bridging the pins. So we'll just have to remove that. There were actually solder bridges on the pins, so I removed them using my soldering iron. Adding some extra flux really helped. All the leftover flux was cleaned off using ice proper alcohol. I used a paintbrush just to help apply it and clean off all the areas between the pins. Afterwards, the boards are left looking shiny and new. This e I see caused me so many headaches. First, the chip shortage made it very difficult to find any e I sees that were available. I eventually found the Texas Instruments TPS 259261DRCR, which was available from an AliExpress seller. I wanted the E-Fuse to have two main functions. It should provide overcurrent protection to ensure no more than three amps is drawn, three amps is maximum current allowed over non-electronically marked cables, and it should have an under-voltage lockout. This is to prevent any attached devices from trying to draw too much power for a non-power delivery USB port. A small problem I had was that the data sheet said that this version of the E-Fuse should automatically try to re-enable the output if a fault condition is cleared. This did not seem to happen, but I didn't really care because it wasn't a feature I needed. The big problem I had was the under voltage lockout set point. It should be set using a pair of resistors of potential divider according to the datasheet, unless I misunderstood it. I chose about 7 volts because it was between the standard 5 volts and the minimum 9 volts power delivery. It should have been achieved by using a 20k and a 5.1k resistor. However, when testing the threshold it seemed to be almost 12 volts. As you can see, the LED indicating the output of the E-Fuse doesn't turn on until the voltage is almost 12 volts, and the under-voltage lockout triggers again at about 11.5 volts, disabling the output and LED. I tried various resistor combinations, and even just a single pull-up resistor. Can you tell I didn't have any surface mount 1 mega ohm resistors? None of the set points seem to match the datasheet values, and I still don't know why, so if you have any ideas, please let me know. My guess is I've either missed a very important aspect of setting the under-voltage, or the ICs might be fake. Although the set point didn't match the expected values, I did get it below 9 volts during my testing, so it did work how I wanted in the end. On these boards, I changed the select resistors and versions of the power delivery IC, so I could test all the different voltages. 9 volts, 12 volts, 15 volts, 20 volts, for 15 and 20 volts, I bypassed the E-Fuse IC because the overvoltage clamp would have limited them and shut off the output. One of the specific uses for the board was to make a USB-C powered dummy battery for my camera. I believe my camera battery contains two lithium ion cells, so it should have a range from 6 to 8.4 volts with a nominal voltage of 7.2 volts. I checked the voltage range with my multimeter to be sure and got the more or less expected values. As USB power delivery doesn't support this voltage range, I had to use a buck converter to step down 9 volts to 7.2. To be honest, I suspect the camera would be fine to take 9 volts, as it's only slightly higher than the battery maximum, but it didn't really seem like it was worth the risk of accidentally frying my camera. So I modelled and 3D printed a case for the power delivery board and buck converter.
that's it assembled and it all looks good. But I want to double check it's outputting the right voltage before putting it in my camera. Yep, that's definitely 7.2 volts. It's time to put it in and see what happens. No magic smoke, that's a good sign. And that seems to be working. I wanted a hot wire cutter and it seemed like a good excuse to use another one of my power delivery boards. So here it is. USB power delivery really is on the cutting edge of technology. A more general use of the board was a USB-C to 12 volt barrel jack connector as it's a really common connector I use for my projects. So now I can power a lot of things using a portable USB Type-C power bank. For example, my UV LEDs I use for curing my resin prints, my camera slider, my magnetic levitating display, Although it's not the most exciting project, it's been incredibly valuable to me. I've learned a lot more about PCB design and SMD soldering, and now a convenient way to power my future projects. I'll have links in the description to the schematics and design files in case anyone wants to use them. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video and want to see more of my projects, please leave a like and subscribe. See you next time.